After independence, Congress began to drag its feet on the reorganization of state boundaries on linguistic and cultural grounds. However, by the mid-50s, the government had conceded to the formation of linguistically-based states in the south of the country, Andhra, Karnataka, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. At the same time, agitations were also ongoing for a Punjabi-speaking state, but these were to no avail. Without going into the detailed history of the agitations, commissions, and political maneuvering, it suffices to note that the end result was formation of Haryana, an extended Himachal Pardesh, and the present Punjab by 1966. This was not the solution the Sikhs had been looking for. Sikhs had already suffered greatly as a result of the partitioning of Punjab between India and Pakistan in 1947. The already shrunken Punjab was further being lopped in half to form a Hindi-speaking state, Haryana, which nobody had asked for. Furthermore, the small remnant of Punjab was still denied the status of a Punjabi-speaking area and was declared a bilingual state. Of course, the language census was taken, but this was a total farce. So much anti-Punjabi, hence, implicitly, anti-Sikh hysteria had been whipped up by extreme Hindu groups like the Jan Sang, that virtually all Punjabi-speaking Hindus denied Punjabi as their language and claimed allegiance to Hindi. The sad fact is that most of these Punjabi-speaking Hindus had to deny that their mother tongue was Punjabi in Punjab itself, since their knowledge of Hindi was non-existent. It was undeniable that with independence there was a movement to bring the Sikh faith into the Hindu fold. That the Sikh faith was distinct and in many ways contradictory to Hinduism was not important. It was more politically convenient for the Hindu majority that there be no minority that represents another point of view and thereby nullification of the central government's social and economic policies. Ian Stevens, a historian and journalist who spent much of his life in India, comments, the British, after 1857, may in a general way be said to have buttressed Sikhism up for imperial purposes of their own, and since the subcontinent's partition in 1947, political pressures from Delhi for the Sikhs' reabsorption into Hinduism have inevitably become stronger. Economically, Punjab is largely a farming state, and it has been made to suffer. Farmers in Punjab pay higher prices for their agricultural inputs but are offered lower prices for their produce in comparison with neighboring states. The central government has assumed sole control over prices and farmers are not allowed to cross state boundaries to get higher prices for the fruits of their labors in the next state. Again, electricity generated by the hydroelectric dam in Bakra on the Punjab border historically has been more costly in Punjab than it is in neighboring states. Very little has been invested in the Punjab by the government, particularly in industrial terms. The government, of course, claims that Punjab is already a rich state, and so the wealth and investment must be channeled into poorer states. This is perfectly reasonable now, but one has to realize that in 1947, Punjab was a state utterly broken and totally ruined both economically and socially by the partition with Pakistan. It has only become successful by the hard work and initiative of its inhabitants, and with virtually no help from Delhi. Now that Punjab is a fairly rich state, and industrial development is no longer a question of finance from Delhi, the central government still frustrates any attempt to develop Punjab. The state government is powerless to undertake any major regional development programs without the permission of Delhi. The states are hardly autonomous units, as Nehru had promised. Even more serious than the general and widespread discrimination against the Sikhs in India is the malicious interference in their religious affairs. One form in which this appears is the strong support given to breakaway groups from Sikhism. The formation of new sects is inevitable, and this occurs in every religion and society. However, the situation becomes very suspect when the government is responsible for giving large grants and land to new movements, and these resources are used to undermine the Sikh faith. At the same time, barriers are placed in front of maximum exposure for religions other than Hinduism. There are several such groups which are Sikh-like in appearance, but fundamentally opposed to its basic tenets, and which have grown out of all proportion purely as a result of government funding. The Demands of the 1984 Agitation To understand the demands of 1984, it is best to explore the demands of the agitation. The demands were not to be discriminatory against Hindus, nor to be considered as separatist, as the Indian government propagated and maintained. 
The demands of the current agitation were based on the so-called Anandpur Resolution. In essence, the resolution demanded greater autonomy for Punjab on lines similar to the provisions already applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The principal demands were as follows. Redrawing the boundaries of Punjab to redress the imbalance and its deviation from linguistic and cultural principles, including the return of Chandigarh to Punjab. The principles underlying this demand are not new, but are totally consistent with Congress resolutions made before independence. The failure to implement these, in the case of Punjab, has already been mentioned. However, it is interesting to recollect that Nehru's own words comply with the sentiments of this motion. It is better to have linguistic states as to bring one kind of people speaking one language and generally having similar customs into one provincial area. The question of Chandigarh is a direct consequence of post-independence events. Punjab lost its historic capital, Lahore, in the partition with Pakistan, and so Chandigarh was built to be the new state capital. However, after the second unwarranted partition of Punjab to form Haryana, by which several thousand Punjab villages were unjustly annexed, Punjab again lost its capital city. Sikhs strongly feel that Chandigarh, being a Punjabi area, should be returned to Punjab and that a new capital city should be built for Haryana. As things stand, Chandigarh is the only state capital which is on Union territory and not part of the parent state. The Judicious Determination of River Water and Electricity Disputes Punjab is a highly productive agricultural state and is in many ways responsible for making India self-sufficient in food. For example, Punjab provides India with 70% of its grain despite its small size. However, Punjab is a semi-arid state and depends heavily on irrigation for its agricultural success. Several canals already take water from Punjab's rivers to other states. For example, the twin canals which go to the desert state of Rajasthan. This is fine, so long as the arrangements are agreed upon mutually and Punjab's own survival is not put at stake. However, the farmers of Punjab, mainly six, were alarmed when they discovered that the central government had unilaterally made plans to divert even more of Punjab's river waters to other states. They showed remarkable restraint in their willingness to allow the Supreme Court to give its verdict on the issue, considering that their whole future and livelihoods hung in the balance. However, the refusal of Mrs. Gandhi's government to allow the Supreme Court to settle the dispute only fueled the suspicions of the Sikhs about the intentions of the central government. Again, it is interesting to note that Punjab is the only state whose rivers are exclusively controlled by the Indian government, all other rivers being controlled by their respective state governments. The Sikhs also see their state victimized on the question of electric power. For example, Bakra Dam was built in Punjab, but now not only is it no longer in Punjab, but it gets a much smaller portion of its electricity than the neighboring states, and at a higher price. Greater autonomy for the states. Punjab has experienced a great deal of interference from Delhi in its internal affairs. This has been particularly true in the case of regional industrial development by the state government, which has been almost totally thwarted. For example, the plan of the Punjab government to build the then dam on the river Ravi to alleviate the increasing demand for more power and water in the state has been frustrated by the central government by withholding clearance for the scheme for the last 18 years. Even development projects which are funded wholly by the state itself are often refused permission by Delhi. The Sikhs insist that individual states should have much more control over state issues and that Delhi should only have control over national issues. Neither is this demand applicable only to Punjab nor is it in any way radical. In addition to Nehru's own declaration that the states would be autonomous units, the British Transfer of Power Act 1947 also provided that the Indian government will be a federal, loose center government exercising power on only three subjects, namely communication, defense, and foreign affairs. The religious demands. These three demands dealt with economic and political matters and were regional demands independent of Sikh issues. However, this last category related specifically to Sikh matters. Considering that these demands affected only the Sikhs, the really surprising thing is that they had to be included at all.